Hello. Um, thank you all so much for joining us this Thursday night. Um, I'm Jason Rosenberg. I use he, him pronouns and I'm from the 92nd Street Y. And this program is in collaboration with the UJA uh, of New York. And um, I, I just wanted to kind of set the stage a little bit um, before we get started. Um, I thought of this program, it was, you know, when we were not virtual, it was called Fierce Fridays. And it was kind of to bring in the best of the 92nd Street Y. So bringing in really great speakers with um, our spiritual leaders and having a really intimate space for Shabbat. Um, and we did it with food, we had it with conversation and we had special guests like Masha Gessen come and Kate Bornstein and um, a lot of different uh, spiritual leaders such as Abby Chava Stein. And um, it, it, was, it was just a, such a great space that we ended up having. And we thought since we were in this virtual space now why not bring people in from uh, different parts of our country, which have never happened before. And um, so tonight we're, we're just so lucky to relaunch and kickstart this program again with Rabbi Sandra, who's hailing from North Carolina and Bench, who's currently now on the West Coast. And you know we're so happy and so pleased to have them both. Um, and I wanted to especially thank Arye um, from UJA who really helped get this started and um, you know made this happen. And we really couldn't have done it without UJ's help, without um, the really uh, good nature of our partnership. And we, we look forward to having this more. And please reach out to me. I can be reached at jrosenberg at 92i for any suggestions, any feedback, um, and any other speakers that you'd like to have a part of this program. And you know our chat is open right now. So if you'd like, you could put down your name, your pronouns um, and your location because we like to see where everyone's from just so we could kind of regroup and recenter of where we are and you know, kind of have a, a conversation flowing as well. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Rabbi Sandra to our virtual stage. And you know, thank you so much for joining us. Hi everybody, um, my name is Rabbi Sandra and uh, we're going to do a little singing, a uh, little blessing um, and getting us ready for um, Shabbat that it is soon to arrive um, and then Benj and I are going to have a conversation. So um, while I'm singing, I want you all to think, think about the things that you are grateful for and if you are so moved, please add them in the chat so that we can in our virtual space, um, lift up blessings of gratitude. And while you're doing that, I'm going to sing Oziva uh, Zimrat Yah. It's, uh, it's from the uh, Song of the Sea, and this melody is by Rabbi Shefa Gold. Oziva Zimrat Yah this you are And so um, as we start to think about Shabbat and we start to think about things that we are grateful for, um, as we head into Shabbat, as we close out our week and head, our head um, into Shabbat, and we're going to like be in our virtual community together for the next, you know, hour and some change. 
So I want to offer this blessing of gratitude. Now, it's not morning where I am. I am aware of that. And maybe it's morning where you are. But I really do think that moda ani, moda for me and mode maybe for you, um, is the best blessing for gratitude. And so moda ani lefa necha ruacha vecha yam shehazar tabi nishmati bechem lecha rabba I'm going to translate it this way. Thank you, divine source of life, for breathing life into me and restoring my soul and giving me another day. And you, the divine source of life, you, God, are awesome. And so yeah, I'm grateful to be here. I'm great, grateful for 90 Second Street Y. I'm grateful for, for my conversation I'm about to have with Benj. I got to talk to him earlier this week and Arye and all the people who put this together and like, tell me the things that you're grateful for so that we can um, all share. Because, you know, this is actually, this is the... Uh, the anniversary of when the WHO declared um, the coronavirus a global pandemic. And many of us don't get to share our blessings in community anymore. And so um, share your blessings so we can lift them up. And also what I want to do is um, we are creating a sacred space. We are making this holy. And the blessing for that is Matovu. It comes out of Torah when this guy named uh, Balaam uh, was basically sent to curse us and met us along the way and fell in love with us and said, oh, Jacob, how lovely are your tents. And so we often say, sing Matovu when we walk into a space. And the other thing I like about Matovu is that when we begin our day, um, we have a choice. We can say this day sucks or we can sing Matovu and remember how grateful, how awesome this day is. Um. Matovu, oh halakaya, oh veshkarotek hayes rayam. Matovu, oh halakaya, oh Mishkarotek ha Yisrael Matovu Oh halaka Yaakov Mishkarotek ha So, um, you know, now I'm, what I want to do is I want to uh, give us just a little bit of Torah. Don't worry. I used to uh, work on a college campus with college students, so this won't be some long, as my paper shuffle, this won't be some a long, drawn-out uh, Torah. Um, this week we are in the Torah portion. Um, I'm actually going to try can't, where is it? Oh, there it is. Um, I'm going to adjust it so that I can see all your beautiful faces. Oh, great. Okay, hold on. Gallery. Yay, there you all are. Awesome. This is so much better because the other view was like my big, big head. Um, so this tour portion is Vayichel Pikude. Vayichel Pikude. It's the, it's the tour portion that closes out the book of Exodus. And what I want to highlight in this Torah portion uh, is that we have built our sacred space. We have finished the Mishkan. We have completed the work of the Mishkan. And the, the Israelites are ready to move forward into the, the Midbar, the wilderness. Um, and they are going to continue on their journey towards the promised land. Now, we know, because we've read this story before, we know that their journey will have lots of adventures, um, and they will undergo a lot of changes along the way. Changes and challenges and hardships along the way. But through all of the changes, one of the things that remains constant is God's presence. Now, 
God was so pleased with the work of the Mishkan that um, God's presence like descended upon them and guided them in the desert. God's presence was there in the cloud. The cloud guided them by day and protected them at night. Um, the cloud was their guiding force. And when um, I like this because, you know, and, and when I'm, I'm thinking about a prayer that we only say at night, Hashki Venu, and a prayer that was written when the night was scary. And we, Ufrosa Lenis to Kotslamaka, we ask God to spread over us a shelter of peace, to spread over us a canopy of peace. And I think about this tour portion and I think about that blessing that we only say at night, where if you could imagine um, a night being so scary where you can't even see in front of you. And so um, when I think about this tour portion, I think about that, that prayer. And we go about our day and we look up into the sky and we see clouds. And maybe um, that cloud and this era of COVID, an era, a time where we could use some protection, uh, maybe that uh, cloud is uh, God's presence or a reminder of God's presence that um, the divine will always be there to protect us so that we are actually never alone. And the last thing I want to say is, like I said, this is the last tour portion of this of the book of Exodus. And so when we finish a book of Exodus, I'm sorry, when we finish a book of the Torah, um, we have these words that we say, Hazak, Hazak, Lenitz, Hazak. Uh, be strong, be strong. And may we all, especially in this past year, be strengthened. And um, as I said before, um, this is the inner, this is the this is when we all went on lockdown. And I'm going to offer a prayer for healing. Um, a prayer for healing for all of us. So for me, COVID is like is like racism. There is no part of our society that COVID has not touched. Um, we've all been affected by this, you know, creature virus that we can't see that it has inserted itself into our entire lives. And, um, and so we all could use a prayer for healing. So if you want to, um, if you need a prayer for healing and you want to offer a prayer for healing, I invite you to use the chat box, um, so, so that we can offer prayers for healing for all of the, all of us who could use a blessing or a prayer. And I will say all of those who are affected either emotionally or physically from this, from this virus, um, I offer this blessing of healing for them. All of the frontline workers, I offer this blessing for them as well. And um, I offer this for our entire country because this has been a year like no other. And um, this is a prayer that I learned from Rabbi Annie Lewis. Um, she took, she wrote the words, um, but the melody comes from someone else. So, when the world is sick, can't no one be well, but I dreamt we're all beautiful and strong when the world is sick can't no one be well but i dreamt we're all beautiful and strong Abraham Yitzhak Ve'yakob Mishabirach Imotenu Sarah Rivka Rachel Ve'leah Uyivarech Ve'yirape Et ko'aulim Hu yevarek vira pe et 
When the world is sick, can't no one be well. But I dreamt we're all beautiful and strong. And so letting that sink in a little bit, um, I'm going to offer a blessing of, of peace. Um, and uh, I'm going to sing a, a something that I, that I wrote. Um, uh, and it um, kind of speaks to the challenge, some of the challenges that our society is having, especially around race. Um, and I actually wrote this song um, witnessing uh, the oppression of a group that I am not a member of. And I came home and I wrote this song and then I put it away and then sort of rediscovered it this year after the murder of George Floyd. Ose shalom bebravam Ose shalom Ose shalom bebravam Ose shalom heaven above we say oh I say shalom I am human and I am free watch me fly above the trees cause you can hear my cry and you can hear my roar, but you can't take away my soul. Oh, say shalom, Berabab. Oh, I say shalom. Oh, say shalom. May the one who makes peace from heaven above We say, ooh, I say, shalom Now listen carefully We'll fight and we'll cry and we'll leave it abide And we'll say goodbye Just to stay alive And the day will come To have dignity again Oh, say shalom Be'erabam Shalom, oh, say shalom, may the one who makes peace from heaven above, we say, oh, I say, Shalom, 
I am a human and I am free. Please watch me fly above the trees. Oh, yeah, say, shalom. May the one who create peace and harmony, create peace and harmony for all of us, all of us down here on earth. So thank you all. Uh, my heart's open now. And so I hope you all are ready to have conversation. Hello, Rabbi Sandra. That was amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I was like looking for you. Where'd you go? I'm here. I'm here. I feel like my heart's open too. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank I you. Even, I didn't even realize how um, beautifully impactful that would be thinking about this being the one year anniversary of uh, COVID. And, you know, I, I know for myself, like, I don't think that I've even properly processed all of that. I'm just having yeah. a space to hold hold those feelings and, and emotions and share space with other people to talk about that. It's um, un unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly emotional for me on this Thursday night. So thank you. Yeah, um, the, yeah it's, you know, uh, the, our world changed in so many ways. Um, and, you know, as a uh, former, former campus rabbi, um, you know, I couldn't, I, I couldn't tell my students like, oh yeah, back in the day when I was in college, you know, we had this pandemic and we're all locked up. Like, you know, I was, I was in pain with them and struggling with them and trying to make sense of it all. Um, and also this is on a personal note, um, my mother passed away mm -hmm. this year. She didn't, she didn't pass away from, from COVID, um, but COVID made it, almost impossible to lay her to rest. Um, and um, uh, I just remember my brother and I having conversations with the funeral director because they were backed up. Um, and uh, things that I just would never thought would happen when I was trying, we were trying to, to put my mother to rest. I just, you know, and nothing was working. Like, um, um, she is put to rest now, but it just was a, um, a very hard ordeal. And, um, but I will say this, regardless of your political persuasions, I'll just tell about my, my mother just for a few moments. Um, mm. <laughs> my mother was a tough lady, um, and, uh, she had cancer for a year and she put up a really good fight. Um, but I'm sad because she really did not like president Trump. But she loved Rachel Maddow. Like, <laughs> she thought Rachel Maddow was it. She just loved it. She just had lots of expletives about Trump. And one of the saddest things is that she didn't get to see how the election turned out. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, thank you all for, for letting me, me share that, that with you. And um, so, Ben, we're, so we're, we're going to have this conversation. And I have to tell I'm you all. I'm excited. I'm excited. <laughs> Yeah, ever since you've uh, and ever since I, you've come into my orbit, I mean, we just met last earlier this week. But ever yeah. since my orbit, I've just been like so fascinated and excited about the work that you do, and it's it's really cool. So so thanks uh, for sharing this time with me. Yeah, and you know, like uh, I, you know, for for the powers that be that put us together, and um, and I, you know, we didn't want to learn too much about each other because we wanted to let some of this unfold. But I'm, you know. I, uh, I, you know, you're, you're a musician and a very talented one. And for me, singing is like praying. So when I was singing in front of you, I was just like, I'm praying, I'm, I'm praying. I'm not trying to do a performance, I'm singing. Um, but, you know, I'm kind of curious about like, I was reading some of your stuff and your, your, your background is just, just awesome. And um, now I actually want to see these movies. I've actually never watched these movies. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you're on a Delta flight, you can. <laughs> it's all good. But I'm just so like, how, how, like, I mean, I don't know what your, uh, I mean, how, how has COVID affected what you do? I guess that's the best way to, to 
to put it. Yeah, I mean, I, I had the same question for you, um, but for me, it's been a really interesting time as a creative person, but also as a human, which I'm sure a lot of people would, would say something similar. I mean, I think when you're working all the time and you're in your treadmill, I'm, I'm trying to look for silver linings, so not talking about all of the, the terrible things that we could talk about, which obviously it's been hard for all of us. But I think one of the silver linings has been um, the creation of space, you know, that, that didn't otherwise exist. And I think, you know, it's funny, is I didn't even prepare as a, as a talking point. Um, but I do think that it's akin to what the idea of Shabbat is supposed to get at. It's like, how do you create space, silence, and in that silence and space, how do you reconnect with yourself? Um, and, you know, that essential thing that uh, you're supposed to command me to do once a week, we've now been given it for an entire year. So it's like, if you don't get it, like, get the point. Like, like, this is a moment to sit with ourselves. Um, and I found that to be really hard, um, you know, like, like really easy to distract myself or myself in particular to like, you know, go out and see a show or do a thing or whatever. Um, but like having to just have silence and listen to me, you know, and, 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 you know, if you, if you believe that like we all have holiness or, you know, if that is, if that is, you know, part of the, part of what you believe, like there's, there's this, um, this forced sense of, of needing to sit with and listen to yourself. So I found it to be challenging and insightful and it feels like it very much connects to, you know, the goal of like why we're supposed to be doing this one out of every seven days, you know, in our tradition, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and in terms of like, you know, the professional stuff, I mean, that, you know, those things are so intrinsically linked because when you begin to listen to yourself, you begin to say, what are the things that I really care about? Like, why am I why am I making something? Why am I wanting to create something in the first place? You know, um, and so it's really been a reevaluation for me about the kinds of things that I want to work on and the kinds of things that I want to make. So that's I'm I'm trying to give just the the, the positive elements here, but uh, but what about you? Like, how has it how has it informed your work? Um, and I, I know it has because uh, like I, I also know that you're like very much viewed as and kind of a boss at being you know, um, a rabbi who exists on social networks and knowing how to use technology. And as there's been this incredible disruption for all of us having to figure out how to use technology, like how has that informed your, you know, I don't even know what is the word. I, I would want to use like ministry, but that's so the wrong word to use in this situation. What, what does one say? I think you're on mute. Yeah, I don't, you know, I think, yeah, I think ministry is fine. I, I, I have spent enough time with Christians that it, it's, it's kind of, it is kind of the word. Um, and I can't, I'm totally blanking on what would be uh, appropriate, but I will say like the sort of joy of COVID, there's, there, there's, there's actually a lot of blessings. Like one, like I get to do this. I have met more people um, <laughs> without ever leaving my house, but I've actually <laughs> met more people totally. than I could have ever imagine meeting in any kind of other life um and i you know and i've also taken up some really in, uh um interesting habits like i'm trying to learn to play banjo uh, <laughs> i like i'm a folky i like I, I i you know my my dad is a is like a cowboy and i grew up on country music and mm -hmm. a mixture of you know r and b and country music and um uh and so like i i like the banjo and and also because i think it's a, you know an african instrument originally and so trying to do that and also trying to get better at um becoming a rabbi with a guitar uh that was there are really good rabbis with guitars um and i i didn't i never saw myself being one of them <laughs> um but what i do that, see what, is, what does that mean like that means well the of music and how you're and how you're um like delivering um torah and all of that yeah i said so, so and i shouldn't say it in a and i'm not trying to throw shade or be disparaging this is um, a weird jewish space so you can throw all <laughs> that's true um but no like i you know there are rap you know like i've just i like there are rabbis who are um the instrument, the guitar, is part of their Torah. It's part of how they um, 
are as rabbis, like they put it on for services and it never comes off. It's they weave it into everything that they do. And um, as a newer rabbi, uh, I, I like to, for me, the, the, the instrument in the singing is sort of a bookend, like I'll open, I'll close, maybe do something in the middle. Um, Cause I just, for me, having a guitar through an entire service for me personally feels like a barrier. Mm -hmm. um, I even switched to a smaller guitar mm -hmm. so that it wouldn't feel like this big, you know, thing in front of me. Um, and, um, you know, so I just sort of like have trying to get, have gotten, trying to get better at that I've been doing more, more writing. Um, I, I love my wife because if I didn't, <laughs> You know, we're both working from home <laughs> um, and she puts up with me and uh, uh, which is kind of cool because that's another thing that we share. Like, you know, we're, I use queer. I don't know what member of the alphabet mafia letter you use. Oh, I'm, I'm uh, good with queer as a catch all. Okay. So we can. <laughs> that's a phrase I learned, by the way, from the young people on TikTok, alphabet mafia. So, <laughs> I, I really like that. It's pretty, it's pretty good. <laughs> No, it's it's cool to be in like a in a queer Jewish space. I mean, one of the, one mm -hmm. of, I have like this this quote that you know I, I think you went viral for. I'll read, which is, "I'm a black rabbi. I've never been in a Jewish space where oh, I was okay. Christian." Uh -huh. Which I mean, let me just repeat that for anybody who didn't hear, because I, I, it's really a, a fascinating thing. Mm -hmm. I am a black rabbi. I've never been in a Jewish space where I wasn't questioned. So I'd love for you to elaborate on that. And mm -hmm. and within this context, like I'll just say, being Jewish, being queer. In America, I I look through the world, you know, with those lenses. But I'm so curious to hear how you uh, how you have a certain lens, even within the Jewish community, mm -hmm. you know, and and how that all relates to your identity. Um, yeah, and that's you know, and so that is that's a piece I wrote that for the forward, and that piece came from a tweet that got a lot of attention in the op-ed. I do I, I'm an op-ed writer. For the forward I use that loosely whenever I feel like writing I write a piece for them I don't like regularly write um and uh but they're like you want to write something about this I said sure so it turned into an op-ed piece and um and if I rewrote it I would actually say it this way that I have never been in a Jewish space where at some point my Jewish identity hasn't been questioned mm -hmm. so um so that so that you know like where I used to work even like I even when like, for example, um, you know, I used to work at, until like a couple of weeks ago, I worked at Elon University and um, um, a parent came in uh, with her daughter to just check out the campus and um, she asked to meet the rabbi and I was upstairs in my office and so the assistant director says I'll, I'll get the rabbi and so um, the assistant director said, hi, this is the rabbi, Rabbi Sandra Lawson meets so-and-so. I don't, I don't remember their names. And um, the mother looked at me and she's like, you're, you're, you're the, you're the rabbi. I said, I am. And, um, uh, and basically three times, it's going to be trying to imitate what she said. Basically three times she asked me if I was ordained, if I was an ordained rabbi, as if a, um, a highly ranked school would hire or any school would hire a non ordained rabbi and so it was her daughter, you know and i'm always paying attention to the potential student and so the, the daughter looked very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt kind of bad for her and I just sort of made a joke out of it and I said hey you know if you come in my office, I have a business card it says rabbi on it maybe that'll help. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Such subtle shade. That's really, <laughs> very classy. A patina. Yeah. Of, <laughs> but 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 seriously, though, when when um, for for many Jews of color, well, the Jewish. I'll just say it this way: the Jewish community for the longest time relied on um, stereotypical markers uh, to uh, figure out who was Jewish, um, and they were just that stereotypical markers. And um, so for many people who don't fit those stereotypes and they're becoming increasingly less reliable, um, 
when people who don't look like whatever somebody thinks a Jew looks like and they walk into a community, they're often met with um, a, a lot of inappropriate questions. Either they're barred from entry, which is the one end, or before they can enter, they're asked a bunch of questions. And, um, or in, in my case, for example, um, I have been, I'll give you another, because I have, there's so many examples. I was at a conference and, um, I was in a, 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 like a rabbi dinner. So everybody in the room was a rabbi. Every single person in the room was a rabbi. Like there was nobody else that is, you know, so, um, and I, and I saw a rabbi who, um, I'd always wanted to meet and, uh, and so I went up to him and I said, hi, are you rabbi and so-and-so? And he said, yeah, since I'm rabbi Sam Lawson, I just want to, you know, thank you for what you, what you wrote. I read a lot of it while I was a medical student. Um, and he said, oh, that's great. When did you convert? And that was like the first thing he asked me, like the very first question he asked me. Mm. And I was, and, and then after he said it, he stopped and he said, wait, I'm not supposed to ask you that, but tell me anyway, why did you convert? And so this is like before, so I'm here I am telling him like, you're pretty awesome doing that. And he, so he knows he's asking me a question he shouldn't ask me. He hasn't, has no clue as to who I am. Like he doesn't know anything about me. He doesn't know anything about my backstory or anything. Luckily though, Oh, no. So then when I, I was so I asked him, I said, well, if you know, that's inappropriate, I'm kind of curious as to why you feel like you need to know that. And he just kept explaining why he felt entitled to know that piece of information. Mm. Interesting, like I said, everybody in the room was a rabbi. So there's another rabbi who came who was at the table with us. And he said, dude, are you listening to yourself? <laughs> like, she just came up and said, like, how awesome you are. And mm. you are like, you, you, you continue to ask her, uh, uh, these questions that all she wants to do is eat her dinner and um, but you keep saying why you need to know so they had their own little discussion and um, and then I went about my my business so it's those kinds of things that um, you know make people who look like me feel unwelcomed in Jewish spaces and my my story as a as a rabbi as a Jew of color as a black queer Jew is a conversion story but that is not true for other Jews of color and um and and you could be walking a very dangerous route if you assume that every Jew of color you meet is a convert because actually most of the Jews of color that I know are actually not and so I had to think about that for a moment but and also many of them I don't know because it's not it's not a it's not a thing that I that I am invested in learning all I care about once I find out somebody's Jewish that's enough for me I don't need any any more information <laughs> It's so funny, like I, I always have thought about like Jewish identity, you know, it's funny, mm -hmm. like talking about songwriting, uh, a lot mm -hmm. of times I asked, why do I think so many Jews are songwriters? And the, that's a good question. I don't know, know if that's true, but I think it's a good question. But the response that I have always given, which I think is true, but this relates to what we're talking about is that, you know, for so much of American Jewish history, Jews were, and it's, by the way, I've, I've written two Christmas shows. And, and so I always get asked, you know, why are all these Jews writing Christmas songs? But the reason is because I think as Jewish people so often, like we have, we have owned that identity of other and we've been observant of, um, you know, popular culture in this way. And as Jews have now assimilated into more mainstream culture, I'm, you know, I, I feel like there's this really interesting loss of otherness and there's something really beautiful like I feel like I'm very grateful to have you know my queer identity as well um because I feel like I, there's two sort of angles of you know uh being able to look at the world as it is and and feel like an outsider enough to observe it and write it down and that's why I think so many Jews are songwriters or so many Jews are, are, are writers so many queer people so many people who feel like they're on that outside of that space I'm so curious, as you know, being in the Jewish community, like, do you see, um, do you do you see that going away for so many, you know, for the Jewish community, like, I, I you know, with with how we've assimilated into popular culture, and like, what do we lose when we do that? Yeah, that's that's really good. So, um, so I'll just narrow that down a little bit. I'll call it assimilating into whiteness. Yeah. So um, every European group 
that came to this country had to assimilate into whiteness because first of all whiteness is a category that that is all racial categories in this country are used to support used to support slavery but the first group of white people in this country were the ones that came from great britain so if your ancestors are britain great you're like the first set of white people that means all other ethnic European groups that came to this country had to assimilate. So that means the Germans, when they got here, there's Benjamin Franklin wrote a bunch of stuff about how he didn't like Germans and had a lot of words for them, germs, germaphobe, things like that, are, are, are playing on the word German and germ. Um, but the Germans had to assimilate into whiteness. The Italians did, the, the Irish did, and um, and, you know, all of them, to do that, they did it at a cost. And so you may understand that your that someone may understand that their background is of Irish ancestry, but white people in this country don't walk around saying I'm an Irish American or I'm a German American. They're just that's just they may know that, but it's not like a it's not a census category, for example. Um, and when Eastern European Jews came to this country, they weren't. Um, seen as why and also I want to acknowledge that I'm not even really talking about the first set of Jews that came to this country which were Sephardic Jews that founded some of the earliest synagogues in our country I'm sort of leaving them off the table for now uh but um so when Eastern European Jews came to this country they were not seen as white um and and when you look at the writings of let's say Heschel and Einstein for example like Einstein um, and all of those like brilliant folks who escaped Nazi Germany um, detested uh, Jim Crow and racism and wrote a lot about it. these are the folks that came to teach at historically black college they helped found the NAACP you know March with King all those all those stories that we lift up those people had escaped um, Nazi Germany and this is pre this is before Jews became white. And this after the Heschel period, after that, like in the 70s, as Jews left the urban areas, um, sort of left the civil rights movements, um, moved to the suburbs, for example, um, and um, assimilated into whiteness. And like I said, all groups did that at a cost. You know, that could mean, you know, anglicizing your last name or plastic surgery. That's a gross example. Um, and but at, at a cost and yeah so something is lost when folks assimilate in, into whiteness and i i hope that in the future we're moving away from assimilation and into multiculturalism where we can honor our past um and be our full selves in our society yeah how, how do you i mean how do you think about infusing uh, like i think about you know racial identity and, and queer identity and Jewish identity and then also like I hear some doggies in the background too um and uh and and also like what you're doing um on you know using these platforms like what is sort of what is your feeling about where progressive Judaism goes next am I asking too big of questions no 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 so my either I think my my wife left and she might be out. I'm not sure, but they won't stop. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, they're excited. By, uh, by yeah, yeah. They're, they're all all. <laughs> 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 Sorry, and they're tiny. Like they're like um, the loudest one is like seven pounds. Like yeah. Okay, <laughs> now she just came in the house. So they stopped. Um, no. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I, I'm sorry, I get with all that I kind of I forgot your question, but I liked your question, but I just want to make no, sure I got I it just, right. You know, it's, I just like there's so there's so um, you're bringing, I think, such like newness in a lot of different ways. I mean, whether it be mm -hmm. social media, whether it be how you're, mm -hmm. you know, talking to people about Judaism, you know, your own perspectives, like, where do you see, you know, the sort of the, the future of a more progressive Judaism, you know, where does that exist? And I know that you've just taken a, a new position mm -hmm. that is part of it is is grappling with these questions. Yeah, I, you know, not in any particular order. Um, you know, we're going to be fine. Like I'm not. I know so there are people in the Jewish community that are constantly worried that we're going to die off, that Judaism is going to die, and that you know, and they like to blame the wrong people. They blame intermarriage. They blame 
you know, women in the rabbinate, they have all kinds of things that they, they, they want to blame for that. But the truth is, is that um, we survive as a people because we evolve and we change. And that's always been the case. We've always had changes within Judaism. Like one of the, 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 the biggest change, of course, was after the second temple was destroyed. And um, as one of my teachers liked to put it, a bunch of radical queer people decided to reinvent Judaism. Um, you know, we could have, we, you know, we were a sacrificial tradition, just like all the other religions of that time period, or, um, and um, we lost our temple, we lost our way of worshiping, our way of praying, and, and some folks were like, we need to, they decide, we need to change this. We, we don't want to die off. And then of course, you know, there were some people like, I'm waiting for the, I'm waiting for the third temple. The third temple is going to come back. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to wait for it. And there was others who were like, you can't, you can't reinvent this. Um, and, um, and we know who won. We know that history. And, uh, and there are, there are still, there are still Jews out there waiting for the third temple. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh so judaism has always evolved and it's always changed and regardless of what you may have been people have may have been taught um you know the orth orthodoxy is not how it's always been no there um the, the orthodox movement decided to you know in, in during in eastern europe they decided to freeze judaism in a particular time and space in response to the reform movement um, and we're now, I'm saying all that because we're now at another point in time where Judaism is evolving. And, um, and I, I think that's cool. And I think one of the things that I find awesome about that is that, um, as I mentioned before about those folks that, that um, reinvented Judaism, you know, in the, in the 80s, um, or the 70s and 80s, for the first time you had women uh in mass translating our text we had mm -hmm. women becoming rabbis because before then we only looked at our text through the lens for the most part of men men looked at it and translated. i'm not saying women didn't look at it but the 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 resources that we looked at were always from men and so women become rabbis women become scholars and now we're lifting up stories in the torah and the talmud that men just didn't really care about they're not they're not i'm not saying they're sexist but it just stories that did, just didn't really matter that much to them. So out of that, we start telling, you know, uh, we start lifting up Ruth and we start lifting up uh, Ruth, we lift up Ruth and Naomi and, you know, um, uh, um, some other stories that, that, that lift up women. Um, and then, you know, we started ordaining queer rabbis. And, you know, out of that, we, we lift up stories like Jonathan and, and David. Um, and other stories, we start to lift up, you know, the, from the feminist movement and the queer, you know, queer, queer movement, um, you know, lifting up Vashti and how we look at uh, the story of Purim. Mm -hmm. And, um, and because we are looking at our text with a diversity of eyes, we get a fuller understanding of the texts um, that are written and how we view them. And also now you have racially diverse groups of people in, in the United States and in Israel also looking at our text and also getting a different perspective. And all of that makes us stronger. All of that makes us better. And um, personally, I'm really excited about um, the future of American Jewry. I'm talking about American Jewry because that's where I live. Um, but like, you know, even our music and our, our Jewish music, like one of my one of my buddies, Joe Buchanan, I don't know if you know him, but um, he's I just he's like a big teddy bear, but like he's just like Texas cowboy who writes Jewish music. He wears a cowboy hat and cowboy boots, um, but it sounds like American music and it's truly Jewish music. And, um, you know, for many young people that I used to that I work with, um, you know, that the music from Eastern Europe doesn't work for them. They want music that speaks to the, to them. And so all that is evolving. It's not, you know, it's not like we're saying that the older stuff has to go away, but every generation gets to put its imprint on, on, on the Jewish community. Totally. I think a lot of, about like what we think about Jewish music. I mean, it's the same thing of these mm -hmm. archaic, you know, like ways that we think about what something has to be because it's what it was, you know, 
Mm -hmm. But you said um, it sounds like country music, but it's Jewish music. Could you just mm -hmm. that out? Because I think I know what you mean, but I would love. Yeah, to no. With us to the, you know, because like when I think about even like you know something, I'm like, oh, well, any song can you know be a musical theater song. It doesn't matter the style. Yeah. It matters like what the substance. It's like. What are we talking about here? How is it? How is it serving a story? Whatever that is, and I imagine that's analogous to kind of what you're getting at in terms of what makes a song Jewish. Yeah. So, like for 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 Joe Buchanan, he speaks. Um, and if you don't know him, he's on Spotify, and he's really and what I've heard. I've heard of him, and I think I've heard some of his stuff. Yeah, and that's just one example. Like that's the first one that came to my mind, but like another one, sort of in that same genre, well, different genre, but sort of roots of music. Is like Nefesh Mountain. They sort of play. They play bluegrass and music, bluegrass infused mu Jewish music. Mm -hmm. um, but since I was, since I brought in Joe Buchanan, um, hopefully maybe y'all will go listen to him and it'll help lift up his his stuff in Spotify or something. But yeah, sure. you know, he's he he is his. You know, he has a very compelling story. He's talked about it publicly, and the way I've heard him talk about it on. Um, um publicly and on a podcast or whatever you know he was married to his wife um and one day his wife said i'm jewish and and your son is too and he's just like what does that mean like i guess they had never talked about it i don't really understand it but she wanted to i've never met her i hope to one day but she wanted to like sort of go back to her jewish roots and so he was like what does all that mean and so he and his own spiritual journey uh converted to judaism and um he's used he says things like it saved him like it, it made him whole and i think you know he feels like it made him a, a better husband partner um ally person and what about and, the song? what about like the song mm -hmm, no yeah so like so even though like I don't like he does call his music country music, but he's someone who will wear a tallit, cowboy boots and a cowboy hat, mm -hmm. you know, so creating this very cowboy sort of aesthetic and, um, you know, his music would fall into like the singer songwriter folk music, but his inspiration is like his country music. So it's kind of hard to like watch him and put his music in any other category because of how he he looks like is it is, he, it, is it like is he using hebrew is he using oh yeah hebrew? so he you know what i mean yeah so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of english but he does he does um uh um you know like like he does this thing on facebook every friday night and then Saturday night he does have Dala, so uh, it's his own music, and so he, um, he usually does the opening of a prayer and the closing of a prayer, um, and um, and you know with his own sort of music. So like he'll he has like a Shema that he sings, and then he he sings the Shema, the 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 the, the Hebrew, but then he also has written a, English words around that. Um, and then when he's done with that, he usually closes with a traditional Nusach of the of the Shema um, uh, and, um, and, you know, he um, also has like English songs that, um, that there's very little if any Hebrew, but it's, you know, he's definitely talking about his Jewish experience or being Jewish. Um, and so it's not like strong Hebrew, but it's, it's, there's Hebrew and, and a lot of English. Too. Something that I'm so interested in, mm -hmm. in 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 exploring more, just in in my own work, and I know I'm I'm guessing, and I know you already do, is like, what are those nuggets of something that is Jewish that, you know, you can infuse with the inspiration mm -hmm. that you know of of where you're coming from to make it feel like it has meaning. You know, I remember for me, like this was such a seminal moment for me because <laughs> it's about actually going to a church. But I met a woman on the one train who invited me to church with her. And I was like, oh my God, why am I, I like, I'm feeling this so much more than I'm feeling my own, like, you know, <laughs> what is what is going on? And to me, it felt like such a moment of like, well, why? Like, you know, it's not, it's not the content of what they're saying. It's like, it's, it's about infusing it with something that feels personal and meaningful. And like, how, mm -hmm. how, how do you do that? So like, I, I'm so interested in, in, in trying to interrogate myself, like, how what makes a jewish song a jewish song you know like what are things that are jewish stories how do we reinterpret mm -hmm. them how do we how do we create new ways to tell these stories um and uh 
you know, and, and weaving together modern and classic, um, you know, whether it be text or themes, you know what I mean? To kind of create something that speaks to us. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I mean that very, like, I mean that in such a simplistic way. Like I, I'm, I'm somebody who my, my uh, limits test is just like, if I feel it, I trust that other people will, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So, there's always such a seeker of like, well, what is that? What is that spirituality that speaks to me? So I'm so glad to know that there are folks like you who are investigating that, you know, on your end and, and know of all these artists that are doing it. And like, I promise that I'll, I'll try my hardest to, to do my best. To- I'm just, I'm just fangirling over them. Like I, my wife will tell you, like I went to, before people even knew who Nefesh Mountain was, like now they've been on time and, and Time Magazine and Rolling Stone and all that, all those places. They played at a little JCC not far from here. And I told my wife, we have to go see Nefesh Mountain. We go and there's hardly anybody there. Most people yeah. there are old. And I'm in the front row, like. <laughs> 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 I was and now like I I'm, I'm friends with them they're they're just amazing and I've you know seen them and and um yeah and they're just just they're just they're just great but yeah and they you know they got like a banjo and uh guitar and fiddle and all. That, that banjo is calling you you know I know I know I yeah I got to it's it's uh because the way I want it it's it's a little harder than I thought it would be <laughs> like I can play it. Let me let me say this. I can play it. Like I because it's a stringed instrument, I can actually play it. But to play it the way I want to play it with the respect and devoted needs, that's where I struggle. <laughs> There's always that divide between <laughs> your ability and your taste level. And eventually yes. if you keep trying hard enough, that chasm will close. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's so I think we're I, I see a message over here. Um, are we on this we... to wrap it up? <laughs> get our show on the road. Well, we'll yeah, now, now we're a, a duo, we're an act that we're gonna I know. Be, I know. do in 2022. So, you have to worry. come back and do this again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so how does how do we wrap this puppy up? Do we is there a prayer? Is there just a we say we say what a wonderful time we had? I mean, I honestly like it was so lovely talking to you, and I feel like I yeah. could more hours. Um, Someone just said, when are we writing a music video? <laughs> uh, I'm ready. I tell you, I don't actually, you know, just so you know, I don't read music. I, I don't. It's okay. I don't. Do you, <laughs> you, have, you have the heart. That's all. Yes. That's, that's what it is. It's like, you know, if you have the heart, <laughs> you're good. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I find inspiration in, in Debbie Friedman, who I never met, but she didn't read music. And she, yeah, you know, left us. I remember going to a Debbie Friedman yeah. concert with my parents. Yeah. yeah in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And it's like, oh my gosh. It was the wow. rock concert of my childhood. It was oh my gosh. Concert. I've never felt more, um, yeah, like wow. with my peeps. Than at that That's Debbie great. Concert. That's great. Yeah. So Jason, what do we do? So I, uh, you know, I just wanted to thank um, you both so much for such a, you know, warm and explorative conversation <laughs> on identity, Jewishness, and everything that you both bring to the world, which is so much of abundance. And, you know, thank you both so much again <laughs> for joining us. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I would love um, everyone's feedback on, you know, what we could, what we could do and, you know, how you enjoyed it. And I just, um, yeah, Rabbi Sandra, if you'd like to you know, end with a blessing, a closing note, I will allow you that space to do that. And then we'll close. <sighs> you know, um, trying to think. Yeah, I'll just, you know, I'll close with the last words of, of Mourner's, Mourner's Kaddish, which I said a few moments ago, because I think it's, it's fitting, you know, um, we'll say Shalom. You know, may the one who create peace and harmony above um, create peace and harmony for all of us. And as we finish out our night and uh, head into Shabbat, may we find the rest, uh, renewal, refreshing, I'm trying to stick with the R's, Mm -hmm. um, the recharging that we all need and deserve um, so that we will be ready to begin our week again. So to all my new friends on this call, uh, Shabbat Shalom, my friends.
Amen. Thank you for sharing. Amen, Rabbi yeah. Sandra. Thank you Thank so you. much again. Thank you, UJA. Thank you, everyone who uh, made this space happen. Th thanks and, uh, to, to everyone. Yeah, Jason and everybody else who, who, who gathered us here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.